In the Gospel reading today, we hear about the Pharisees coming to our blessed Lord and asking the question of whether divorce is something that is allowed. And he asked the question, what did Moses command? And Moses, back in the book of Deuteronomy, said that a man could write a bill of divorce and send his wife away. But then Jesus immediately corrects that. And he said, Moses allowed that because of the hardness of your hearts. But that was not God's intention. And so Jesus then sends us back to the very beginning. If we want to know what marriage is really about, we need to go to what God intended, not to what humanity has done to it, but to what God's intention is. And so our Lord then repeats what is in the book of Genesis, as we heard in the first reading. A man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and the two become one flesh. But then Jesus adds another line that is found nowhere else in sacred scripture. Here and also in St. Matthew's Gospel in the same basic passage. And Jesus says, what God has joined, let no man put asunder. What God has joined. So we need to look then at what Jesus is talking about here to be able to see the holiness and the beauty of what married life is really about. This becomes absolutely crucial because recall that Sister Lucia, one of the visionaries from Fatima, back in the 1980s wrote to the man who was going to be the first head of the Pontifical Academy for Marriage and Family. And she wrote and said, the final battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan will be about marriage and family. So you realize at this point, you are at the center of what is happening. Your marriage, your family, God's vocation for you is right now in the crosshairs. And the question is, do we recognize what marriage really is so that we can maintain the dignity of that sacrament and understand also why this is so important? Married life is the foundation of the church and of society. If marriage is destroyed, the church and society are destroyed. It's just that simple. We can even take that a step further. We see how in God's providence, there is this order of perfection in creation. You see that particularly in the first chapter of Genesis as God continues to create on the successive days. But today we see the last being that God created. And that last being God created is a woman, which sets her therefore as the highest in God's creation, in his material creation. The woman therefore being the highest is the foundation for everything else. She is the foundation for marriage. She is the foundation of a family. And therefore, not only is the weight of the marriage and the family laid squarely on the shoulders of a woman, but as I said, if marriage and family are the foundation of the church and society, then all of that is resting squarely on the shoulders of women. That's why Satan hates women so desperately. He's going to get his ugly head squished by a woman too, but he absolutely despises women because everything is right there focused on the woman. So what has he tried to do? To destroy women to destroy the dignity of women, 
to make us think that somehow women are less than, the women are not equal to, the women are objects, the women are only good for one thing. And what's even worse is in our society, women have bought that lie. It's not just that men have bought into that stupidity, but women have bought it. And therefore, what we see in the first reading or in the gospel when Jesus talks about what did Moses allow, and they said, Moses allowed for a man to write a bill of divorce and give it to his wife. Isn't it amazing that we live in a society where 90% of divorces are initiated by the woman, not by the men. It's women who want out. It's women who've decided that they don't want to be in this marriage. Which is another interesting point because in a survey that was done a couple of years ago, the question was asked, if you had it to do over again, would you marry the same person? And I think it was close to 90% of the men said, yes, I would marry the same person. And 20% of the women said, yes, I would marry the same person. So we really need to look at what's going on in marriage. And we need to come to the defense of marriage. And the way we have to come to the defense of marriage is to begin by recognizing the dignity of married life. To understand, first of all, for those who are called to be married, it is a vocation. It is a call from God. It's not just, well, you know, I've always wanted to be married, so I think that would be a good thing. That is a good thing. But it's more than just the desire to be married. I wanted to be married and have 12 kids. God had a different idea. The poor woman that I would have been married to is very grateful that God had a different idea, but <laughs> that's beside the point. The point being that each one of us has to do what God is calling us to do, not necessarily what we want to do, but what God wants us to do. So if he has called you to be married, we first of all have to recognize that something similar to what we heard in the first reading takes place in your heart. And it's both ways. We only hear it from one side. We hear about Adam when Eve is created and the joy that is there. This one at last is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bones and she shall be called woman. But both the male and the female should rejoice in that same way when they find that one person whom God is calling them to marry. Because that is the one person on the face of the earth who is going to fulfill them. The only one who can fulfill them. So that again brings us to an important question is, for those who are married, are you seeking your fulfillment in this other person? Not the absolute fulfillment, only God can do that, but are you loving God in this person and are you loving that person in God? So many of us in this materialistic society are seeking our fulfillment in other things, in money, in materialism, in whatever sorts of things we're never going to be satisfied with that. You can have nothing and be perfectly happy, not in the Klaus Schwab sense of that, but in the sense that if you are in love with this person and the two are one, you're going to find fulfillment and you're going to find the joy and the happiness of your life. That's not easy. And it's not easy because of original sin and as well as our own sins. But understand when we're talking about marriage then, that this is how you are fulfilling your baptism. By baptism, you are a priest and a prophet and a king. And so to live that out in your married life is to die to self 
and to live for the other. Back when I was a kid, there was a song, I think they just simply called it the wedding song or something like that. And there was a beautiful line that was in there and it said something to the effect of, woman draws her life from man and gives it back again. That is what happens to the two people who are married. Look at what happened when Eve was created. Adam is put into a deep sleep. There is a death of sorts. And God takes the rib from Adam and he builds it into Eve. And we have a new human person. Adam had to die to himself so that Eve could have life. And in that, as the two become one, Eve gives that life back. She dies to herself and gives that back to Adam, who again dies to himself and gives that back to Eve, and the two are giving life to one another. That's what's supposed to happen in marriage. That is living your priesthood in marriage. In other words, what's happening right here on the altar when you come to Mass and what happens when you come up to the communion rail is exactly what should be happening in your marriage. It is a sacrifice. It is a total giving of one's life. It is a dying to self and giving life to the other and receiving life from the other and giving that back. That's what happens with Jesus in the church. Or St. Paul talks about that in his letter to the Ephesians, how the, the marriage of, of, of a man and a woman is a reflection of the marriage of Christ and his church. All of this is predicated, however, on the point that Jesus made. What God has joined, let no man put asunder. What is the difference between the point that Jesus made, the two become one flesh, and the next point, what God has joined? A natural marriage, the two become one flesh. In a sacramental marriage, your souls are joined. Understand that. That is where the difference lies. If you go to a judge and the judge says you are married, you know what was holding the two of you together? A piece of paper. It is a contract and it is nothing more than a contract. And as far as the state is concerned, you can break the contract and you can sign a new contract with somebody else. And you can do that as many times as you want because it's just a piece of paper and we can nullify the piece of paper. When two people are married in the church, it is a sacrament. It is holy. And it is God who joins the two. Not the flesh. The two of you join your flesh. That's the actual sign that you're married. The ring on your finger is the sign to the rest of us that you're married. The actual sign of your marriage is the intimacy between the two. God isn't the one who does that. God does something far more profound. He joins your souls. The two souls are united in a bond which is unbreakable in this life. No judge has the ability to say you are no longer married because the judge didn't join your souls, God did. And God is the one who says that the two are united until death. That's why Jesus said if someone divorces his wife and marries another, he commits adultery because the two are still united. And now you're trying to do something with somebody else and it's a lie. You're trying to say the two of us are united. In other words, the physical part of the marriage is the expression, the physical expression of the spiritual union that is there. Well, if there's not a spiritual union, there can't be a physical expression of it. It's a lie. That's the point that Jesus is getting at. And so we have to recognize that. 
This has again become a very important point because fewer than 20% of marriages are taking place in a church anymore in America. Fewer than 20%. In other words, there are many people who are getting married who aren't united. Their souls aren't united. It's not a sacrament. We have to do it God's way. That's the part we have to recognize. This is how God is making the vast, vast, vast majority of people saints through the call to married life. And yet, if we don't do it God's way, we're not going to grow in holiness. God's way is to be selfless, it's to love, it's to die to self. The worldly way is about me, it's about being selfish, it's about what I can get. That's not what marriage is. Marriage is about what I give, not what I get. It's two people giving themselves 100% and two people receiving the other 100%, which means there's nothing left to reject and there's nothing left to take back. You've given yourself away totally. The two are one because God made them one. That's the part we have to begin to understand is the dignity, the beauty, the holiness of this vocation. Marriage isn't some second-rate way of life. Marriage is holy. Marriage is a call from God. Marriage is the way of saints. And if that is what God is calling you to, you also have to recognize he's calling you to the most difficult vocation in the church today. So if you want to be a saint, don't be a priest or a nun, get married. Being a priest or a nun is a good way to become a saint too, if that's what God is calling you to. But married life today is the way of saints. It always has been, but more than ever, because this is where the attack is. And if that's where the attack is, then it's necessary for people who are called to this vocation to defend it, to promote it, to live it, to live it in its fullness, because this is what Satan's trying to undermine. So it's necessary for people who are married not just to live through the day-to-day -day drudgery of your life. That's not what you're called to. You're called to make one another saints. So dig into this. Look at the beauty, look at the dignity, look at the holiness of your vocation and live it. Because God has worked a miracle. He put your souls together. He did the reverse of what happened in the garden. In the garden, he started with one and he made two. In your marriage, he started with two and he made one. And in that oneness, you are to live your, your priesthood. You are to die to self. You are to live with, for the other. You are to build one another up. And you are to help one another to become saints. This is such a profound thing. I see that I'm way over time, so I better shut up or Mass is going to be late. But begin to understand. I can go on and on and on and on. Well, I guess I wrote a book about it. So I can go on for a long time about married life. But please, if you're called to married, look into this. Take it seriously and dig in and live it. Because this is what God is calling you to, and this is the only hope. You are our only hope, those who are called to be married, because you're the foundation for everything. So if you can see that dignity and you can embrace it and you can live it, not only are you going to become saints, but actually you're the ones who are going to save the church and society. You're the only hope we have. Yes, our, it's only the Lord, but he's working particularly through you so see that, recognize that, embrace it and live it. Live it to its fullness.
so that you can become the saints that God is calling you to be.